And I'm going to be talking about mitochondria. Mitochondria are the batteries in our cells, in our body, uh, uh, throughout our organs. Um, I'm going to show a lot of proof of concept studies, so I don't want anybody to go out and harvest their own mitochondria and inject themselves. Um, so, so the real question that we're asking is, what if we could replace your mitochondria uh, in, in specific situations so that it was just like replacing that battery uh, in the car? And what's happened really, really over the last decade, it's overwhelming how often we see mitochondria implicated in age-related diseases for all sorts of different organs. Um, in, in ophthalmology, um, I, I asked one of my colleagues, you know, uh, they've done these amazing GWAS studies, what are the genetics, what are the things that surprised them that came up? Uh, and they mentioned, hey, we found a bunch of mitochondrial uh, 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 genes. Um, and it, it, they've been implicated literally in every organ across the body. Um, we heard a lot about clocks and the epigenetic clock and the amazing work that's been done uh, uh, there. Uh, the mitoclock is a concept that we're developing, and I'll just briefly show it to you. We, we learned earlier today that different organs, different cells even, age differently, and there's ongoing debate, how do we define aging and longevity? What's the right kind of clock? I think we're going to end up with lots of different clocks. But in this case, this little case series I'm going to show you, this is a 93-year-old woman. We can sequence the DNA of the mitochondria, and everywhere you see a little blue dot is an area where there is actually DNA mutations. Um, and we can assign a damage uh, a score to this, and here we've called it 25%. Within the same family, here's a 62-year-old, uh, um, and you can see the number of blue dots are much, much less. Um, these mitochondria were isolated from the urine, so they're likely coming from the kidney. Um, and then the youngest member of the family, a 32-year-old, has significantly less damage. Um, and so I think we're going to uh, come to a time where we are using multiple clocks, we're using the epigenetic clock, but, but as we look at different systems that we're trying to help improve aging, um, something like a mitochondrial clock will, will be important. Um, we can take those scores and we can put them on a, on, on a graph here, um, and what we find is, like the other biological clocks, at a certain age is where we see uh, a rapid decline. Um, certainly the lifestyle factors, the other things that have been shown, um, uh, if you're not following them, I don't typically follow them. I think I've had the worst sleep schedule here. I had amazing food, um, and I'm not exercising this last week, so I'm sure I've aged uh, a lot, and I flew on a really long flight. Um, uh, so, so this is one aspect that we think could be a, an important uh, contributor to, to aging, and the, the aspirational goal of our, our company for Mitrix is can we, can we adjust this clock by boosting uh, uh, patients and, and people in specific conditions by periodically boosting the, the mitochondria. So, um, it, you know, our bias, of course, is that mitochondria is a foundational cause of, of human aging. There's lots of data that the mitochondria uh, function declines uh, as we get older, and this dysfunction is a big big part of uh, aging. There's a number of mechanisms that we heard about, cell senescence, reactive oxygen species, but if you don't have that battery to run your, your cells, uh, you're going to run into to issues. Um, what's interesting is that humans seem to be more dependent on this than some of our other models of aging, like, like worms and, and, and mice, and I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. Now, there's an amazing phenomena that was identified long after I went to, to medical school, and, and I kind of had to do a double take on this, um, is that uh, mitochondrial transplantation is kind of happening naturally inside our bodies. Um, so stem cells and cells release extracellular vesicles, little, little pockets of lipid, um, in the bloodstream, and different cells are exchanging mitochondria all the time. This is not something that, that, that we identified, um, but in the blood system, these mitochondria are uh, going to different cells that, that may need that cell. Um, in the image uh, on the left, you see a person getting a, a blood transfusion, um, and one could imagine uh, uh, performing a, a, a mitochondrial uh, a transfusion uh, here. Um, this was described and, and fairly well established by our, our colleagues uh, uh, at Harvard, uh, 
And, and now there's lots of work showing that even within the brain, different kinds of brain cells exchange uh, mitochondria between themselves. There is some kind of natural process. Not all the mechanisms are fully understood. And then it was mentioned a little bit earlier today about uh, uh, using mitochondria uh, uh, exchange and transplantation in and around heart tissue uh, uh, that, that gets uh, uh, damaged. So let me tell you a little bit about mitlets. Um, so when platelets are activated in the blood or they get old, they release lots of extracellular vesicles, and these extracellular vesicles contain mitochondria. These mitochondria, can, as I just showed, can be exchanged to the other surrounding um, cells. And they're, they're constantly developing these uh, uh, and delivering these, these mitochondria. Um, and, and what Mitrix has done is to collect platelets uh, from a transfusion center um, and has developed a process to extract the mitlets from there um, with the idea that I just showed a moment ago that these, these mitlets themselves could be uh, put into a transfusion. And in fact, when, when, when people are doing blood transfusions, um, they're probably also including uh, uh, mitlets uh, during those uh, uh, cases. Um, so back to the Honda minivan, our mitlets, these are the tiny little battery packs that already exist in us that decline with aging um, and there's an opportunity here to uh, uh, address uh, 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 different conditions and aging with them. Um, and this is a you know, relatively recent study showing that in humans, as we get older, the, the mitochondrial DNA content in these extracellular uh, vesicles uh, will, will undergo decline. So another alternative approach to making mitlets, harvesting mitlets, and really something that you can scale up is a bioreactor. And this is something that we're borrowing from our uh, colleagues who have been developing cell therapeutics. Um, so it's possible that what Mitrix has done is to take stem cells, um, which have young mitochondria inside them, grow them in a bioreactor where we can grow them at a very high scale, uh, expand those stem cells, um, and then I'm going to show you that there's ways to kind of manipulate them. And here we can make lots of them and, again, uh, uh, package them uh, for, for storage and, and transport. Um, this is another cartoon. And on the far left corner, one of the cool things that we can do is when we're actually growing them up in our bioreactor um, is we can coat those mitochondria with, with specific uh, uh, biomolecules that actually will uh, make those mitlets selective for different tissues and different kinds of cells. Um, and then we can, again, grow these at, at a very high scale. So let me start with one of the examples in proof of concept studies. So um, as physicians, we all know that if we have a very elderly patient who co comes in with an infection, their chances of surviving that infection, the intensity of that infection that has on them is going to be much more severe than if we have a, have a young patient. And there's, there's lots of different uh, uh, data, just showing some here. Um, now, the, the idea that, that we wanted to test was whether if we could take an older person suffering from uh, an infection, give them young mitochondria, could we actually reverse their aging of their white blood cells to make them respond like a, like a young person? Um, and we turned to our, our friendly uh, model, the mouse, as a proof of concept here. Uh, so one of the things we have is we have fluorescent mitochondria, which are really cool. So we can follow the mitochondria that we deliver to an animal or a cell. Um, in, in, the, in the right, we're showing um, after injection of the mitlets, the, the fluorescent mitochondria, we can see that they get taken up by the white blood cells. Um, on the right, uh, or yeah, you're right, number two, um, we have a septi sepsis model. So sepsis is a condition where the blood is infected. And once the blood is infected, that infection can go all over the place. The survival rates are very low. And in this experiment, what we did is we took young mitochondria, um, and transfused it into a 13-month-old mouse, which is a very old mouse. Um, and the graph is showing that um, normally, in the, with the black dots and the black line, the, uh, the, the mouse will die within a day. Um, but transfusing young mitochondria that get taken up by the white blood cells allows it to survive. With COVID, we learned a lot about the cytokine storm. And so different kinds of infection 
Um, it's not the infectious organism that's killing us, but it's our own immune response that's overreacting and stays at a very high, high level. Um, in um, an H1N1 infectious model in, in a mouse uh, on that lower panel, what we're showing is that if we give an old mouse a uh, transfusion of these young mitlets, we can actually reduce the cytokine storm and the cytokines uh, uh, released there. Um, this is another proof of concept. We've heard about neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, uh, biggest kind of uh, 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 major issue affecting uh, elderly. Um, here we're performing a similar experiment. Um, this has been published, so I'll just show a brief figure from that. Uh, we've taken one-month-old uh, mitlets from one-month-old mice transfuse them into elderly mice. Um, and the panel in the middle with all the black spots is showing uh, a, a protein complex that's in our hippocampus of our brain. This is important for uh, uh, how those cells function, how they form memories. Um, and here that we can show that we can actually regenerate that, that protein uh, complex. And there's some really interesting data that uh, mitochondria um, also will, will actually cross the blood-brain uh, barrier. Um, uh, for things. Um, this is another proof of concept. This is we've, we've loaded up an, an old mice with uh, mitochondrial injections, uh, mitochondria that are actually isolated from the, from the liver, and we can take a look at how it grows fur, how that regrowth of fur uh, takes place, and, and, the, and the grip strength. And um, this was exciting to me because on a daily basis, my 17-year-old son tells me how much hair I'm losing in the back of my head and how weak I am. So. Um, this is some work from my own lab, and this is a different kind of clock. So we heard again about epigenetic clocks, mitochondrial clocks. So we do have tissues, and you know, th this is from the eye, um, where we can't sample DNA. Um, so you can't stick a, uh, something into the eye, sample the DNA, and the cells aren't releasing much of it. Um, and the eyeball is, is sort of an enclosed system like some of our different organs, and molecules made in and around the eye are heavily diluted when they go out to the blood. So um, uh, what we did was collect fluid from inside the human eye. So the most common surgery done on the planet is cataract surgery. Um, we collected 100 microliters of fluid using a high-resolution proteomic platform. We uh, generated an, uh, an AI-based model to measure proteins and predict the age of the eye. Um, and in panel, panels A and B, where we replicated it, we end up coming down to about 26 proteins that can, uh, in a healthy eye, um, we can actually predict and pretty accurately tell how old the patient is. Um, we then took a number of diseases, including diabetes, different stages of diabetes, proliferative diabetes, where there's actually bleeding inside the eye, uveitis, which is an autoimmune condition. You have overactive inflammation inside, uh, uh, inside the eye, and some of our genetic diseases of the eye, retinitis pigmentosa. And in the far uh, the panel C and D, all those colored dots or different patients with different eye diseases. Um, and, and, and it's striking that um, patients who have suffered those conditions on our proteomic clock of the eye show accelerated aging, or as I learned this morning, age deviation, uh, I want to call it. Um, and so some of our diabetics, the, the age of their eye is actually 30 years older. Um, interestingly enough, Several of those patients have actually been treated for their disease. They're not bleeding inside the eye. They have their inflammation uh, controlled. But there seems to be, in this instance, a permanent hit where, where the eye is showing biomarkers of aging that are elevated. And um, uh, there, there may be an opportunity for anti-aging therapeutics, even when clinicians think they've treated and controlled the, the disease. Um, I'm going to show you some proof of concept studies we've done in and around the eye. So this is uh, age-related macular degeneration. It's the number one cause of blindness in the developed world if you're over 50. There's um, close to 13 million cases right now. We have 71,000 new patients each year. The images that I'm showing you, we, it was awesome. David Sinclair showed some pictures of the eye, so I feel very at home. Um, this is, these are pictures of the retina. Uh, up on the left, that big right spot is a bleeding area. There's areas of degeneration. Um, we have great phenotyping in ophthalmology. You can see there's, uh, that's a cross-section of the retina with fluid underneath it. Um, and in the bottom right, that big black hole is an area of RPE cell, retinal pigment epithelial cell degeneration. Um, and uh, recently, Judy Dench had to stop acting. She is amazingly healthy, an amazing actress. 
Um, but she has macular degeneration, so she can't read the script. She can't see. That's what she told us, where she's standing and, and who she's supposed to be talking to. Um, so, so really a, an important disease. Um, and uh, what, what's amazing and interesting is that there are GWAS hits that show uh, uh, that come up with mitochondria. There's good evidence that there's mitochondrial uh, decline um, in this tissue. And the retina, the retina that we're looking at, is the most metabolically active tissue in your, in your body. It, it needs the most oxygen. It's firing all, all the time. Um, so we wanted to know, could, could we transplant mitochondria back to the, to the cells we wanted to target? Um, and so uh, we've become surgically really good at precisely delivering any kind of molecule to cells inside the eye. This is why gene therapy in the, in the retina was the first FDA-approved human gene therapy. Um, and um, it, it's trickier, but I've got people in my lab who are really good at delivering molecules in a mouse eye, which is about two and a half millimeters um, uh, in size. And so here what we've done is we've taken fluorescent mitochondria um, and surgically transplanted them underneath the retina. Um, and what we're showing on the far left panel there is all of these bright mitochondria that have been taken up by the retinal pigment epithelial cells, which are exactly the cells one would want to target in uh, macular uh, degeneration. Um, if we deliver the, surgically deliver the mitochondria in a different way, um, what we're showing here on the far left is if we inject it into the sphere of the eye where all the fluid is, um, that mitochondria will actually track uh, to the optic nerve, um, which is what uh, uh, David Sinclair was showing with his epigenetic reprogramming, the same, same uh, uh, tissue, tissue target. What's really interesting is in these two instances, we've prepared the mitochondria differently. And so if we coat those mitochondria or isolate them differently, there's an opportunity to be very specific about how we, how we target uh, uh, the mitochondria. So um, these are... Um, uh, uh, Mitrix's four most critical mitochondrial areas, the immune system, um, where we think intravitreal or intravenous injections of mitlets can restore youth, particularly in, in, in infections like sepsis, uh, in the retina, which I've shown, um, where we can precisely surgically deliver and target specific cells throughout the eye and address causes of blindness, um, the skin, uh, um, and, and then the brain. Um, we had a talk earlier today in discussion about how does this get financed, how do we convince the FDA, um, and I'm, I'm of the mind that, that one of the fastest ways to longevity therapies is to accept the FDA, uh, to go after disease causes, disease therapeutics that are linked to aging. Um, Aubrey mentioned, I think it was Aubrey who mentioned the orphan disease model. Um, so there are specific orphan diseases uh, in the tissues that we're describing here where uh, it makes a great business model where you can treat uh, a very few number of people that are highly phenotyped, either a genetic condition or a rare condition, uh, get through clinical trials faster and then expand out to um, a bigger uh, indication. Um, uh, in medicine, this happens all the time. Um, we, uh, a drug is given for one indication, and then we realize, hey, it's doing something for the other indication. So I think that can be part of the strategy, where we're, we're very selective about specific diseases that we treat. Um, and that may be the entree to getting the data we need in clinical trials for, for then addressing longevity, as long as we, I guess, all decide exactly what is aging and, and, and what is the end point. Um, our first indication in the pipeline is, is um, we're, we're working to manufacture um, uh, the, the mitlets that we think can go in for the immune system. This is almost an orphan indication. Um, it's, it's very akin and uh, close to doing a, a blood transfusion and delivering cells into, into patients, which we do uh, uh, routinely. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we think this is going to translate pretty well into humans just because the, the mitochondrial damage that we see in patients and patients as they age and in their immune system is more significant than we see um, in mice in some of the models that, that we've uh, uh, used. Um, and depending on how we formulate things, we can actually tune it so that the, uh, the, the, the treatment uh, uh, lasts for a specific amounts of time. As you know, because, we, of course, we've done some prior interviews and talked about mitochondria. That's our, our 
work is in mitochondrial transplantation and specifically what I'm now calling mitochondrial restoration, which I think is the most accurate term. Uh, the, the target is to treat astronauts. Mm-hmm. However, the initial first four trial people are just volunteers right. who have basically said, we're willing to volunteer to try this be- before we take it to the astronauts. Okay. Go ahead. But the astronauts are our target, our target for treatment. Um, yeah. Once again, the, 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 uh, as we age, our mitochondria become damaged and we lose them. Um, and, and we lose as much as I think 30 or 40% of our mitochondrial mm-hmm. DNA by the time we're in our, let's say our eighties. Okay. Right. And that means less energy that that's what causes aging. So, our solution is very simple. We're just going to fill you back up. <laughs> if you've lost 40% of your functioning mitochondria in your body, we're just going to fill it back up again. So if, if, if your, your body right now has a mixture of functional and dysfunctional, it's really black. I think it's really black and white. It's uh-huh. And so as you age, you have more and more dysfunctional and less and less functional. So it's a ratio. Okay. Yeah. It's almost like shades of gray. And so what we're trying to do is push that ratio back towards the younger state, which means we're just putting in more functional mitochondria. Okay? Right. right now in the animal tests we're doing, which are mostly in mice, we're able, we're finding that we've gotten up to the point where we can put in about, you know, a, a quarter to a half a percent of the body's mitochondria per treatment. Okay. Which mm-hmm. is a huge amount, by the way. And this is this is what we've been working on for the, the past three years is figuring out how to get more in there. OK, yeah. so you figure I want to get anywhere from two to 10 percent boost. We don't know yet what's going to have the beneficial effect. There'll be a certain threshold mm-hmm. where you will suddenly have more energy. And when you have more energy, your cells have more energy, which means that they can do their jobs, which means they can dispose of waste products. Your neurons have more energy. Your muscle has more energy. OK, right. And. We don't know yet if that will cause, we've seen in animals that it has caused reversal of aging phenotypes. We've seen mm-hmm. muscles grow, we've seen them get stronger, we've seen their, their cognitive processes improve, we've seen their immune systems dramatically improve. So I'm hoping that'll happen in human beings. Good, good question. We're gonna start with something very, very, very slow and simple, which would be skin injections almost like allergy injections, because we want to see, I mean, if we inject in the skin, are we going to see damage? Are we going to see blisters? I mean, these are all things that you do to make sure it's safe. And then we'll slowly progress that to bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, And eventually we would like to, yeah, the goal is to do systemic, uh, systemic injections. And a key part of using human volunteers, we want to know what it feels like. And that's something that and this is a problem with animal trials. They can't tell you what it feels like. Right. And that's very important. Okay. First of all, you talked about doing PRP therapy. Well, PRP therapy is mitochondrial therapy. Okay. Right. In my in my perspective, because platelets are a, may, one of the biggest sources of mitochondrial transfer in the body. So when you're taking platelets out of your blood and injecting them, let's say, into a joint, you're literally moving your, your mitochondria over into some place you're trying to heal. Okay. Same thing with stem cell therapy. Stem cells are primarily mitochondrial donators. So <clears throat> when the people fly off to Panama or, or Thailand or wherever to get stem cell therapy, they're getting a mitochondrial therapy. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm saying is it's not, this is nowhere near as new as it sounds. The difference is that what, we, what we've done is we've identified the piece of that puzzle that is the critical part. And then we're amplifying it dramatically. I and mean, we're doing much, much. It's not enough to take it out of your blood and put it back over there because you're not really changing anything. You're just moving it. We're yeah. talking about increasing. Okay. Correct. And there's there's actually, it is it is quite simple in theory. Uh, in reality, there's a lot of very tricky, incredibly tricky biology going on. And that's what we've been researching at, at our labs. But yes, we grow it in a bioreactor and it is literally a stem cell bioreactor. Mitochondria don't grow by themselves. They have to be grown inside cells. So we grow stem cells in a big bioreactor. We pull them out. We extract the mitochondria. We put them in a coating uh, or some kind of carrier. And then we either inject them under your skin or into your intravenous. And we've talked about doing it 
into the eye. There's all kinds of ways to to get them into the body. Let's talk then about the trials, because I noted that you were maybe going to be performing the trials either in Japan or perhaps leading regenerative medicine clinics that are, let's call them offshore, right? So, I mean, are you in discussion with uh, regulators in Japan on this? We, we are just starting that process, yes. We have hired, uh, well, one of our people, one of our uh, executives, exec- executives actually has a huge amount of experience doing that. We've talked to some teams in Japan. There are universities who are interested in jumping in. So it's actually quite doable. A lot of stem cell companies go to Japan. Uh, it is extremely rigorous science. It's very well done. They have excellent facilities. So the reason we chose Japan is that in Japan, if you get through what's called phase one tests, which are the safety tests, mm-hmm. that they have a process there which is sophisticated and, and, you know, takes some effort to use, but they do have a process where you can start uh, basically treating people, treating patients, uh, and that the patients will do self-reporting of the results onto some kind of website. And then that's a, it's more of kind of a crowdsourced approach to the regulatory question of efficacy. Okay. Okay. So we do safety very, very carefully. But once it's proven safe, then they say, "Okay, well, you can try it for all kinds of things and let's see what works. I mean, there's a lot of good, good medical facilities all over the world. And um, it's not that we don't want to do this in the United States. It's just that the United States right now is is, it's a struggle to get through some of these early phases. And it's also a very, very big market. And, you know, we also are cognizant of the fact that it's going to take time to scale this up. Yep. To us, hunger is that you're fundamentally changing their cellular and genetic structure and moving it backwards 30 years, which is a right. Thing. So, so absolutely, we're going to have tremendous amounts of data tracking. And I want to mention, by the way, that one of our main advisors is probably the leading authority in the world on doing that kind of high level, massive tracking of the of the body's systems. Mm-hmm. And this is another reason why we're we we want to work with astronauts. Because astronauts have been, that's exactly what they've done. They send them up into space and they look at their, their look, look at their physical condition when they return. There was a case where they took two twins. One went into space and the other one didn't. And they did the twin study. So, um, yeah, we'll be doing a huge amount of measurement. Um, well, we, we, we became, very, we've talked about this at great length. And we became very clear on the fact that doing primate studies, for example, it actually doesn't help us because human beings are so different from other animals. Every animal is tremendously different. You know, mice, mice don't age like anybody else, right? So mm-hmm. we do all these mouse studies, but what good does it do us? Cause they're different. So um, you could do mouse studies for the next 15 years. You're still at the, at certain point, you have no choice, but to go into the human, into humans. And it's going to, you're going to have to start from scratch anyway. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and, you know, doing primates is ethically, there's a lot of problems with that. It's incredibly expensive. They don't tell us a lot of the things we know. They won't be able to tell us. Uh, and I also want to point out mitochondrial transplants already being used in humans already. Yep. It's just not being used for aging. It's being used for other rare diseases. So it's not like we're, well, we will be the first by any means to do it in human beings. Other people have already done that. Mitochondria have an advanced uh, accelerated healing uh, property. So if I could smear mitochondria on a burn on my arm, what the early research has shown is that that can cause rapid healing. Okay. So I have a radiation. If I get a big radiation dose and I get, and I get sick from that, I mean, mitochondria are known to be affected by radiation. So if we replace them with healthy ones that we've kept inside this, this bank with lots of radiation shielding around it, then presumably we can help those people, uh, you know, recover from that. So <clears throat> in, in from our perspective, from the mitochondrial perspective, the healing and aging are actually two sides of the same coin. Okay. I've always thought that. And so if we can use a small amount of this stuff to help save them from some injury or help them recover or heal or so forth, then we can use larger doses in much larger quantities to slow down the aging clock, and I think even potentially reverse the aging clock, okay? The plan is to do it, try to do it 
if possible, at the end of this year. It'd probably take about a year from from starting point to get through the initial regulatory uh, paperwork. And we have, obviously, there's lots of preparation to do. So all that is dependent on funding. And, and as you know, funding in the, in the longevity field has is, is been a challenge for the last couple of years. So, um, but it should be, I'm hoping at the end of this year, or early next year. 